I, I don't know where to start about talking about Tom Carlin. I met Tom 30 years ago. Uh, he was a banker. He's from Philadelphia, and he's a New York Mets fan, and we try not to hold that against Tom. I've seen Tom in the classroom and, and, and seen him interact with, with bankers, and he's just absolutely marvelous and world-class at what he, what he does. This, this guy's worked with RMA, regulatory agencies, uh, and banks all over the world, and his focus and his forte is teaching bankers the technical side of lending. I worked with Tom at a, at a major bank uh, in a management training program and uh, was able to watch him interact with students. He's really engaging, very interactive, and uh, really, really knowledgeable. Tom's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the trends in financial services uh, from a commercial lending perspective. Um, and we had a great Q&A uh, at the end uh, about some of the things that are going on. Tom's terrific. So enjoy your 10 minutes with Tom Carlin. He's, a, he's just a wonderful guy. Take it away, Tom. Well, Jack, it's great being uh, on the call. It's uh, Thanks for inviting me. Um, exciting to be talking about what happened last year and what to uh, what we're going to expect for for next year so um, let's talk about last year before it actually started what were the expectations that were out there and then what actually happened in the year well first off starting off the year loan growth was down it, it has its loan growth has been down since uh, 2012 what everybody expected was going to happen was oh we were going to get a big trump bump in the economy and that um, uh, this was really going to push up lending because regulations would be cut we were going to have a very business friendly uh, environment again regulations cut um, tax rates being cut for businesses. And uh, also, we were expecting to see smaller loans especially increasing a lot. Uh, everybody across the board predicted this, that they were going to increase a lot with uh, you know, regulatory declines, especially with the dot. But, you know, that was, that's what we expected. What, you know, actually did happen? Well, in the economy, GDP was up and employment was down and housing prices were up. You know, all those things were, were really, really good in 2007. However, it didn't translate into a lot of loan growth. Sluggish loan growth continued uh, in throughout, you know, in 2017 from the prior year. A lot of the a lot of commentators out there cited the reason for this was the regulatory climate. Uh, I travel around the country teaching, as you do, Jack, you know, and the banks across the board, both both large and small, complained about the increased oversight and the costs that came along with it. However, that is true, but the real reason that the, the uh, you know, the, for the sluggish loan growth was that businesses were just not expanding. This was because the economy, um, uh, the, the growth in the economy was somewhat tepid and uh, businesses faced weak demand due to this tepid recovery. And businesses are hard pressed to justify uh, borrowing to expand, you know, in light of these facts. So loan growth really faced a hard time as banks shied away from making smaller loans because of the paperwork and regulatory costs. You know, the, the, the regulatory costs of making a small loan is about the same as big loans. So a lot of banks focused on bigger loans above a million dollars or so. In addition, the, these compliance costs cause many smaller banks to merge or, or sell. This trend is very worrying uh, with, with this merging and, and selling because uh, uh, some of the provisions of the Dodd-Frank bill, the banking regulations, can restrict many smaller businesses from having access to bank funding you know, in their smaller towns with the smaller loans. 
let's talk about the actual volume, you know, of of loans and whether you know banks were profitable. Even though we had sluggish growth, the um, profitability is a different story. Total with CNI loans, the total growth again remained sluggish in 2017, far beneath the pace of a year ago. Ticked up somewhat in the fourth quarters. We're still waiting for some of the numbers from the fourth quarter. And some sectors did better than others, um, such as hospitals, food, uh, manufacturing, and utilities borrowed more. But others, like professional services, for example, so they, they went down. With uh, commercial real estate, with CRE, residential loans led CRE growth with balances across most other property types declining uh, over the same period of time. Even though growth was sluggish, as I said, profitability was up. The rise in earnings was generally driven by um, net interest income as interest rates have gone up. There is one exception to this, and this was in SBA lending. And the SBA lending numbers showed increasing loan levels in the SBA loan programs to small businesses through the 7A and 504 loan programs. The SBA approved, you know, upward around 70,000 loans in these programs, the 7A and the 504 loan programs. These programs provide, oh, about $30 billion to small businesses. The, the the SBA has a flagship program. This is called 7A, and the 7A provides small businesses with guaranteed loans, covering the you know basically what small businesses need with working capital, fixed asset financing, you know as well as refinancing and export support through uh, term and revolving loans. So. Uh, that was the story with loan volume and profitability. With loan losses, let's get to another topic, loan losses and provisioning. Um, according to the FDIC, the number of institutions on the problem bank loan list dropped to its lowest level since 2008. That's pretty good. And banks, however, a lot of banks started increasing their provisioning due to the um, hurricanes, all right, in various parts of the country. The um, credit quality. Um, in 2017, the probability of default for CNI loans was at, a, at its lowest level since 2014. A lot of small business loans that might have been directly done through the bank in the past were done under the auspices of the SBA. And this helped reduce the probability of default. For CRE loans, the, the number of CRE loans, you know, risk rated high pass or passed, increased over the last several years. So again, good trends in that area also. From a teaching perspective, I'll just give you some anecdotal knowledge that I have. Again, going across the country and talking to bankers. Some uh, areas of the country are seeing uh, declining loan standards, fewer covenants, et cetera, uh, due to increased competitive pressures. Also, from a teaching perspective, a lot of institutions are uh, giving a lot of lip service, basically, to their uh, commitment to small business lending. Some are even spending large amount of dollars training staff on how to better interact with uh, small business customers to bring in better, more creditworthy deals. They want the people that are out there roping them in to know more of, uh, about financials and what they're talking about, et cetera. And I expect we're going to see more of that going forward. Well, that's 2017. Let's talk about um, 2018 and what we want to, you know, what we're going to see in 2018. So, um, oh, there are a lot of conflicting viewpoints as to what this year is going to bring. You only have to turn on the TV and switch from one channel to the other to, uh, and from one economic expert to the other 
to see what effect the tax cuts are going to have on investment and capital spending. My expectation is that a lot of businesses, they've, they've got their budgets and planning set already before this tax package has been passed. And uh, my expectation is that any effects from the revised tax landscape will come in the third and fourth quarters with only modest growth in the beginning of the year. This economic growth expand. Lower tax rates will be especially beneficial to financial institutions as they pay higher than average tax rates and they don't have you know, as many available deductions as certain other industries. So it should help bank profitability. Profitability um, should also increase with increased interest rates. Interest rates are projected to go up and this will help banks' profitability. In addition, you know, if you just turn on the news, there is talk about a bipartisan approach to revising some of the Dodd-Frank regulations, which if that actually happens, should help boost um, profitability. There is another trend, and that's the trend is towards um, reducing exes, all right, through increased uh, branch consolidation, headcount reduction, and digitation. I expect all these things will uh, continue. However, um, investments in technology and continued regulatory related expenses will, you know, off, offset this somewhat. I also expect to see in 2018 more of a trend towards these smart credit cards, more institutions offering this that where you can just turn them on and off, uh, you know, at your, at your will. You know, you've seen some of the commercials on TV all, all, already for this, and I expect this trend to uh, continue. Um, smaller banks um, are playing a catch-up game with digitation, and so they're trying to um, merge together with other organizations to be able to compete just with some of the larger banks. Uh, and reducing expenses through this automation. And again, I expect that to continue. So uh, anyway, that's my summary, Jack, of you know what I see happening in 2018. Well, you know, we, we don't get a chance to talk a, a lot. And we've done a lot of webinars together. And certainly over the third, we've known each other. We've, we've had a chance to chat a lot. And you know how much I respect you and, and your your abilities and your knowledge. So I have, I have a few questions that, that maybe bankers might ask if this were a live uh, program. And let me yes. just throw them out at you and then we, we can maybe go one at a time. Uh, payoffs, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of payoffs uh, and I wonder if you're seeing that. Uh, swaps and how banks are using swaps as far as lending goes to improve their fee income. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is uh, can commercial real estate lenders, and this is where community banks grow, can commercial real estate lenders uh, become CNI lenders and have the patience to be able to do that? You've, you've already addressed digital, and I'd like to talk a little right. bit more about that, the digital borrowing. And the last thing I want to talk about is in the new tax law, and while you don't do much as, as much on the personal side as you do on the business side, the equity loan um, uh, interest deductions have been eliminated, and I'm, I'm yeah. curious as to your take on what's what's happening in that. So let's let's go back to the top payoffs. What yeah. what are you seeing with your clients in terms of businesses wanting to to pay their loans down? Um, I see that there's an increasing trend to that, and and partially it depends on different areas of the country. Jack, you hear different things, you know, with, with that, but. Uh, there's also a trend to uh, leaving banks and going to other non-bank sources for funding. This is a, you know, a trend that's picking up somewhat exponentially. Um, anyway, so I, you know, I, I expect to see, you know, that happening again. The, you know, the, the, the paying off, you know, is going to continue, but it's going to be on a regional by region basis. And when you're when you're seeing this going to fintechs and other non-bank lenders, is that small business or has that crept into the middle market at all? It's more middle market. It's more middle market going to uh, those not so much small business. Okay, but gotcha. we'll see. 
as these organizations grow and expand, we'll see if they start going, you know, a bit smaller with some of the loans that they're that they're offering out there. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. fair. Now, now with yeah. with margins being squeezed, now the margins are going to get a little better. But w are, what are you seeing with banks trying to do around swaps and and getting some fee income off of these loans? To be honest with you, Jack, you know, I I have not heard. Uh, of that many institutions doing that. Maybe you've heard more about it in your travels, but um, it's not a trend that uh, you know I've heard all that much about just in my travels. That doesn't mean that it's not happening. All right, that's fair. Well, let's talk yeah. patience. Um, you know, uh, you talk different parts of the country. People out east tend to be a little less patient. People in the Midwest are kind of more patient. People out in California and the West Coast are real patient. But the whole idea of this having a banker being a generalist versus a commercial real estate loan uh, lender is, is I'm, I'm seeing more uh, happen as well. Uh, banks want to move more towards CNI lending, but if they've got a commercial real estate lender, they may not have the patience. What are you, what are you seeing about bankers being able to migrate through the various different kinds of businesses they're lending to? It's slow going. And the, uh, this happens particularly you know, after, uh, geez, you, you know, you had the banking crisis that happened 2008, 2009, et cetera. A lot of the regulators came in and a lot of the banks, especially a lot of the smaller banks, their whole portfolio was CNRE lending, you know, CRE lending. And they they were pushing them to do more CNI sort of, you know, lending. And a lot of my training over the last number of years has been going into those types of banks and nudging them down that path of doing more uh, CNI um, lending. And some of it went in fits and starts, Jack. The, um, they tried to go too big. Some of the smaller banks went too big with some of the CNI that they were, they were going after. Rather than small businesses, they were going after larger loans and structures that they weren't that comfortable with. And now they've pulled back a bit and uh, they're going after small to middle market businesses, trying to get people more up to speed on um, understanding their customers better and their customers' asset, asset conversion cycle, both for lending and uh, to understand how they would need to borrow and also for treasury management. So uh, to become what somewhat more of that, that buzz term, right, right, Jack, that trusted financial advisor, the, um, a lot of them are trying to do that, uh, you know, to break more into the CNI market. So I th well, think that's going to continue. Yeah, I do too, Tom. And and the last couple of things you 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 mentioned digitization and the whole idea of people borrowing on a website or going to a, a mobile device to borrow money is is yeah. it, you, you and I are kind of old school. It just seems like I would never do that. But but young entrepreneurs <laughs> that. Uh, uh, th that are doing th are doing this in record numbers. Are, how are banks responding to this? You know, the the thing is, a lot of people think with with going online, there is a trend, of course, to going online with the digitation is cheaper to process the loan and all that sort of thing, and that's going to continue. But the banks are are continuing to respond by in the branches giving better customer service. Everybody thinks that the millennials, for example that they don't like going to bank branches, that they like doing everything online. That's simply not true. They do like going to bank branches. And so this, this whole, the branch trend, while you might have some consolidated, the branches are gonna be there. And I think that they're gonna to have to compete on the branch level with getting to know their customers to better in order to compete. How, they're going to be focusing themselves on reducing cost in the back office with automation, with uh, documentation, applications, and all that sort of thing. You know, they're, they're trying to reduce their expenses uh, that way in order to compete, you know, against the online. Okay, that's fair. Last question, and this is a crystal ball thing because nobody really knows what's gonna happen with this, tax, with this new tax law, but equity loans have been eliminated, interest on equity loans have been eliminated yeah. from taxation. So, so what, what do you see in there? What, what's going to happen? Um, I think that, um, well, home equity, I mean, if you just think about it, it's um, 
some of the interest is, you know, if someone needs to borrow, let's say someone needs to borrow, make a, a you know, on a personal level, they need to borrow. The um, home equity loans are even with the tax advantage being eliminated, are still a more attractive alternative than borrowing under a credit card or something along those lines. So um, I still think home equity loans are going to be there. What do you think? Well, I agree. And I, I can't speak for you. When, when Bob St. Meyer yeah. and I started our business 18 years ago, um, we didn't borrow money because we couldn't. Uh, banks would lend yeah. to us, but we did have home equity loans, and that's how we, we, we certainly made it through. So I agree. Well, uh, yeah. Tom, you know, I, I got to tell everybody on, online, this has gone a little more than 10 minutes, and I anticipated that when Tom and I get together, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a long conversation. But um, when, when Bob and I refer anybody a, around teaching credit skills, there's only one buddy we, we send them to, and that's you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. So, so <laughs> tell, tell everybody, email address, phone number, website, how do they get a hold of you? Um, they uh, can get a hold of me at uh, the easiest uh, email address would probably be Tom at thomascarlin.com. That's T H O M A S C A R L I N dot com. And the phone number is 914 834 4555. So um, that's how they get me. Thank you. Being on with this, Tom, 10 minutes with, you, you, you've you give, given us some great prognostications for 2018. All right, Jack. So you want to get a hold of Tom Carlin? You should. Uh, if you've got some needs in the uh, technical areas around commercial lending, business banking, um, consumer, uh, give Tom a call. 914 834 Four five five five, and a lot of different email addresses. Tom's pretty active on uh, LinkedIn as well. But here's an email address you can reach Tom at. It's Tom Carr One at MindSpring dot com. You reach out to Tom there. You'll be able to get uh, all kinds of information about what Tom does. Hey Tom, thanks for taking ten minutes with us. <laughs>